So basically, I do a show called Dung Mummy Radio. Uh, it's on killradio.org. It's on Thursday nights. And I go by the name The Ustad. So what is it? The, the Ustad. The Ustad, all yeah, right. So it's a, obviously a joke. Uh, I promoted <laughs> myself. You're to not an Ustad? Master no? <laughs> not exactly, but oh, okay. I kind of promoted myself to that level. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, yeah. so, so I'm, uh, well we call U- ourselves the Secret Chiefs. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this is The Ustad, and I'm here with uh, Trace Bruins from Secret Chiefs 3. And uh, they just performed two nights uh, a residency here at the Bootleg Bar. So uh, I want to first comment about the very auspicious moon that we had above us this week. I wonder if you noticed. Oh, actually I didn't because I'm in Los Angeles. You have this waxing crescent moon that's like about 18%. It's like very pretty much a symbol that you see in Islam all over the world. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean... And then Jupiter was right there next to it. Right so next to it. See the moon and the star and I was driving to your show on Sunday night and it was like that was what I saw in the head. Uh, yeah, I mean you, you you wouldn't want to mention you know uh, planetary worship to Muslims, you know, you wouldn't want to imply that that's what's going on there. I mean this is this is the province of the Sabians and the the, the Babylonians. I mean if you think about where the crescent came from on the on every mosque and you see the that there's these three globes Beneath the crescent, it's a fascinating story where all of that stuff came came from, but we don't speak about these things. Really? Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't dare. You don't dare speak the uh, the secret. Uh, well, it's none of my business. <laughs> I just read about it. You know, it's not yeah. it's not my business. So where where do you get your influence from? Uh, as far as like, what are you reading lately? Lately? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I don't know how much what I'm reading lately plays into the music, but. Lately, I've been reading uh, Paul Virilio a lot. I really like him. He's a uh, well, he's Italian ethnically, but he's like a French. Uh, it's terrible that you know you talk about philosophers and everybody. You know, it's going to get related to Derrida or something, or you know, Zizek. And you know, he's really like he couldn't be farther away from those guys, but because he uses words that are not like current vocabulary or something kind of gets lumped in with all that stuff he really couldn't be more opposite to all of it he's the only guy really there's another guy named Peter Slotodik who's you know of course not French saying similar things not not really that similar but anyway I really like these guys who take a stand you know and uh, nobody cares that they take a stand I feel really alone that I care (laughs) will somebody care in 200 years yeah actually you know I've heard some stories that there's you know people who are like you know he does this kind of geopolitical analysis and there's people who are are more responsible for creating geopolitical situations who have noticed that he's right about everything that he predicts or almost everything or the way he says things end up end up being you know corresponding to to reality so then they started getting a little bit weirded out by him, and they started asking him, well, what do you think is going to happen? Only after his predictions came true. Yeah, and they're not really predictions. It's just his analysis. is the, mm-hmm. It's the right way to, to, to look at things like progress and what our notions of speed and the, the speed with which our technologies develop versus the speed with which we can comprehend uh, not just those changes, but even something as simple as a, a tree going by. We don't really understand that the tree itself is quite hard and in a, you know in some people's lifetime the tree be, you know was a stationary object that gave you shade and would, could never kill you unless you climbed up it and fell out of it but now it's something that if you're racing by it at 65 miles an hour will kill you really instantly it's it turns into <laughs> this deadly thing you know and it's on the side of the road what I mean, should we cut all the trees down cuz otherwise it's, they're just going to kill us right but then they turn into these soft, blurry, amor- amorphous things. You don't even notice them. Right. They're just going by, you know. We, like our, our sense of perception has, has altered radically as a, 
as a result of of speed, and not just physical speed, also the speed, the exponential curve with which you know technologies develop, and we pat ourselves on the back for you know creating all of these things, but we don't ever think about you know there are consequences when you create a steam engine, when you create a locomotive, you also create a head-on collision of the loco locomotive. You've also invented you know the accident that's associated with the thing that you invented. So the switching system, you know, on a on a locomotive, the switching systems on the trains, that was back when people used to assess the the danger. The switching system came from trying to avoid these inevitable accidents. It was, you know, it's a good, it's good, a good development technology, and somehow we've sort of forgotten the risk assessment. We just sort of think, well, we can invent it, and it'll take care of itself. Like that, this part got lost, I think, in the last like 60 years, like the risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So if you really, I was really good at pointing out all these places where, yeah, we forgot. And somehow we think that if we race to the finish line faster, we can invent enough stuff that will get us out of the mess that we're creating that's catching up to us. You know, it's an incredibly paranoid way of looking at things, but it's also incredibly right. You know, I love him. I really love him. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, w w how does that relate to your music? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I told you that was the first thing I said. <laughs> as far as your, your latest tour, uh, I personally, I was going to go see you guys in Morocco. And, oh, and man. it didn't work out. Yeah, I'm real sorry and, about and, that. And, and you guys were sort of the last ones to cancel. <sighs> we held on know. to it. We held on to it as long with Alan Bishop and Rick Bishop. Yeah. yeah. What, what what exactly went wrong with that festival? Or well, there were a lot of things wrong with it for, for a pretty long time. Mm -hmm. And really what happened was um, some of the bands who backed out a little earlier than we did, you know, got the feeling that, that it, things weren't going to mm. pan out right. And we have got, we have sort of thrown ourselves into situations like that where other bands would back out. Yeah, with good results, you know, in the past. So my thing was, you know, let's let's just stick with it. Sure. Uh, we know the guy who's putting it on. I also knew that, you know, he's not 100% cognizant of the way things work in Morocco. Hmm. Uh, no one is. <laughs> I'm wondering about. That. Yeah, yeah, nobody is. But he's. Yeah, I, I could tell, like, you know, it's a steep learning curve. You go in there waving a flag saying we're going to do a philanthropic project in Morocco. The first thing you're going to meet is, you know, the people who are going to teach you how it works in Morocco. And then, if you have enough money after that <laughs> left over, then maybe you can do something because maybe they'll help you. He didn't really, he didn't learn that lesson fast enough. And, uh, and we were trying to advise him, like Alan knows the Middle East really well. We we're trying to like right. tell him like, you know, it's this way, it's this way, it's this way. But I think in, in his way, he wanted to sort of be the one to tell us how it works kind of thing. So it's like, okay, you know, you tell us. Okay. And by the time it got to look, you know, there are people who bought plane tickets. There's people who bought tickets to the thing that's like 300 euros, 250 euros. Right. You got to level with them. Like we weren't even saying level with us because we, you know, he didn't give us deposit, didn't give us any money. We're just like, look, just tell them who do they call, who, where are the contacts on the ground, who who is in charge of the snake venom kits, <laughs> who who is going to set up the tents, who you know, and once we realized that actually there were no answers to those questions, Guys, the there were no numbers, down, so we gotta, yeah. there were no numbers, there were no uh, contacts. And he also told us that we have to do everything through him. So in other words, 22 bands and 700 people have his phone number and somehow that's all going to get magically coordinated through one phone number. That's when we pulled out. Yeah. It's just like, man, you know, so you got nothing basically. That's sad. That's a sad thing because we really wanted to, to make it happen and help him and support him and, you know, and yeah. do it because it should happen. It's not Morocco's fault. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it, it really seemed like the kind of the greatest festival ever created. It could have been great. It didn't need to be in the Sahara Desert. It could have just been at a club in Marrakesh. That, that would have been cool, you know? Yeah. It just, 
who's over ambitious or overly ambitious yeah. and and stubbornly uh, um, I would say stubbornly unresponsive to requests for information mainly because there wasn't any information to give you know so the tour that you guys are, are on right now it seems like you're doing two nights and can you explain well maybe sort of back up and explain the seven modes that you guys have within your project Secret Chiefs 3 and then sort of explain what the two nights were that okay. we just saw here in Los Angeles right well the seven bands or the seven modes of Secret Chiefs 3 is a, I mean it's a kind of a big subject um, I guess the simplest way to explain it would be you know if you, you fire a beam of you know white normal electromagnetic white light into a, a crystal or a prism it, and it, one that that refracts things into, into pure you know red per, pure blue pure violet I guess that would be the, the symbolic model in a way we have a, a band that's central that diffuses the the motifs the really simple motifs of the band into the different uh, sub bands mm. so it's kind of why you would hear like for example Ishrakiyun uh, is playing uh, one of our one of the what's recognized as an Ishrakiyun song it's actually only an Ishrakiyun song because the motif was sent to that particular band and that particular band has a characteristic of doing rhythms that are not uh, not on a grid there's like n uh, the, the rhythmic concept is more um, based on ratios or relationships uh, for you know like irregular uh, durations mm -hmm. rather than um, you know subdividing everything into like 17 16 time or something like this <laughs> whereas the same motif can be sent to Ur which is just a surf rock band that just yeah. does everything in straight eighth notes and everything in western tonality. So it's the same motif going into a different filtering system. I, I, I just conceive of that as different colors. You know, it's basically the same light with the same um, information mm -hmm. being sent in a different modality. So what we saw in Los Angeles was the first was Ur, which was just the straight eighth note, straight western intonation surf stuff. Rock. Surf rock stuff, yeah. or like even like new wave is like straight eighth notes, you know. Sure. <laughs> the motorik, you know, the the, oh, yeah. the kraut rock kraut stuff, rock. just straight up eighth Noi. notes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's this is the perfect like you the know, river. And there's a great Apache beat that Noi called it. Yeah. yeah, and it's a there's a great beauty to this to this incredible simplicity. You know, and we we try to. I mean, we're a little bit more complexity oriented or something, so the. For us, it's the most exotic thing in the world to be playing, in a, to, to trying to trying to access that <laughs> beautiful simplicity of the eighth sure. note, you know. And then uh, the next thing was forms mostly, mm -hmm. um, but also basically that that second set was like a hodgepodge. It had forms and and traditionalists and a couple some stuff from the early records before it was seven bands. And then traditionalists being more kind of the soundtrack. More like uh, a film music film stuff. Score, yeah. yeah. Italian horror meets. There's yeah. yeah there's Italian horror. There's uh, spaghetti western type right. of stuff. Basically, the the idea with traditionalists is it isn't necessarily film music, but uh, yeah, kind of a nostalgic. Uh, well, let's let's put it that uh, you know, if there's a if there were better days. <laughs> <laughs> where there was craft and there was respect for the craftiness even you know like it, here in town you know the, like the NBC studio orchestra all the incredible things that happened in this place you know and the, all the incredible things that are not happening there now right. you, know, you know what I'm saying <laughs> it's a it's a it's a nostalgia oh, no, for I'll the share some of the blame living in Los Angeles <laughs> <laughs> it's nobody's fault man right? come on <laughs> come on <laughs> it's a it's a eschatological process. <laughs> yeah, we're just riding on a, I, uh, this yeah. wave of degradation. It's disgusting. Yeah. So what, <laughs> what we do is we try to uh, <laughs> try to counteract that with this kind of tragic nostalgia. That's what traditionalist is all about. And then uh, then the, the set tonight. The first set tonight was the Masada stuff, which is John Zorn's music, and uh, what really has nothing to do with the Secret Chief sort of cosmological ideas, but. Uh, you know his Masada tunes are really their own uh, creature. Even in his in his output, it's a really unique thing that he's done. And it's easy to get the idea that you know 
okay, well, he wrote these real simple tunes or just lead sheets. You can fit two of them on a page, it's just chords and a couple of melodies, but, and, you know, sometimes they're really weird time signatures. Yeah. And he wrote 300 of them, and they must all be, you know, kind of the same or something. Man, I got to tell you, it's not like that. Like, it, I, it's unbelievable how how well constructed these these tunes are and we when he threw the the 12 at us i mean he gave me the whole book and said fish through it and look for something that works and then i asked him like you know if you have anything that you think would work best for us i'll take some of that direction too and the ones that he picked were like you know absolutely perfect absolutely perfect for us so he picked the yeah yeah. usually he doesn't but i asked him to do it okay and so he did it and it so was he was familiar with your music already because yeah. I think he had produced um, uh, an album from your he produced band. a Mr. Bungle yeah. thing but like yeah I think the Secret Chiefs touched a sort of different part of, of his you know psyche or something and man he was exactly right you know what he what he asked us to do and so the first time we read through those tunes I just wrote down notes of how, it, how we should arrange them and that's what ended up on the charts I just you know kind of augmented them with a uh, you counter melodies it's really the integrity of, of his compositions was always what that that whole thing was about so tonight you know what we're doing is playing our arrangements of it kind of stripped down but it's his it's his compositions that I think shines through more when we play it live it's a little bit kind of reminds me of maybe some klezmer and then there's some like Romanian gypsy kind of elements um yeah, Probably sure. not exactly, but it just sort of reminds me. Oh, for sure. No, like, like for example, like that last tune, Omael, the first time we read through it, like, I'm, you know, first thing that I, I'm hearing in it, is the, you know, was the the fact that it is like a kind of a, a Romanian tonality to it. You don't hear that particular scale in, uh, in much klezmer music. Right. So I, we just decided to kind of interpret it that way. You know, he's really happy with that, so... I mean, and, you know, Timba, Timba went to Romania and studied some violin with this guy named Marius. It's a really crazy, toothless violinist really? guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we had at least, like, some ability to uh, to pull that off a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can bullshit our way through it in L.A. at least. And, <laughs> you know. People are, we're way into it. Yeah, yeah it's cool. No, it's, we, have, we have a great fun with that music. And then the last, uh, the last set was Ishrakiun, which is uh, one of the, the Secret Chiefs bands, and that's the one that does like ratio-based harmony and ratio-based rhythm, um, and all that means is that it's just not really grid-based music. It's pre pre grid, I suppose. I mean, if notation is quarter notes, eighth notes, eighth note triplets, sixteenth notes, you know, that's not what what that music is. But it's also not Persian music or Arabic music or you know it's 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 none of that. It's well, listeners to my show will know that I use the three and the four both as my introduction music. I actually, take week. it back. The three, the three is an Afghan song. Is it? It's okay. an Afghan song. Yes. Yeah. So people will know that. that but that's in, the the, the that irony there the is that the, the the three is actually in Western temperament. The Afghan song is actually ah. in just straight up Western chromatic. Okay. And it's weird too because like on a sand tour. The you know the Persian sort of dulcimer instrument, right. you can't play that song because it's too chromatic. Like the the santur is you know you have to tune it to the seven note scale, the daska, or the you know the family of notes uh, that you're playing in, and you, the first three notes of that melody are are chromatic and just simply can't be done on a on a traditional <laughs> Persian <laughs> instrument. So it's weird, just you know it's this weird thing where it's actually a Western temperament thing. I like I like these kinds of weird paradoxes. So you guys are, are basically a fusion band. I mean, if you want to, in basic terms, we zoom out a little bit. I mean, you, if you were to play, have you ever played your music to, to people in you know some like other culture, like in sure. Iran or? or, or yeah, Af- no, we've played Afghanistan. in Turkey, we've played in Israel, and you know we've played all over Eastern Europe, and you mm-hmm. know we haven't gotten we were supposed to do the Morocco thing, we haven't right. gotten as far as Iran, you know. Right. Uh, that would be cool. We'll be going to Russia next year, but oh wow, yeah, the Middle East is sort of the next thing because from we have a pretty solid thing in Turkey and in Israel. Really, and it okay. shouldn't shouldn't be hard to to get to Egypt and Lebanon from right. there. So it seems like if if you were to 
perform that for traditional musicians uh, in those countries, it'd probably be foreign to them. Exactly. No, yeah, it's good you understand yeah. that. Most people don't quite get that. They're like, oh, you guys are playing Arabic music. They're, you know, they must love you in the Middle East. <laughs> well, if you think we're weird, I mean, believe me, <laughs> they think we're a lot weirder. Than really? You, you know? yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, people will find something familiar, especially Persian, you know. Persian people will hear kind of familiar, uh, habitual, you know, patterns and stuff like that mm -hmm. because it's... I don't know, somehow I have that kind of more in my blood for some weird reason. But I don't know how to, like, I, I couldn't sit there and play Persian repertoire. I mean, I know lots of mu musicians who do, and I can't, you know, I can't do any of that stuff. But you were born and raised in California, I take it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So where did this all come from? I mean, where did your love of this uh, Eastern kind of modality... You know, I'm going to be totally honest with you. It, uh... It started when I was living in San Francisco and, uh, you know, going th in the 90s, going through the sort of, you know, underground fucking hipster avant-garde crap that everybody <laughs> goes through. And, you know, it, it just gets expensive. You're, you're buying records and, it's, you know, it's expensive. Yeah. And uh, I would go over to Berkeley and there were a couple of record stores there and they Habiba had... Or no man, like Srimadis, like these these Indian record stores. So they had like you know cassettes, you cassettes, records, vinyl. You know, you'd see all these film soundtracks, and it'd be like ninety nine cents for a cassette, three bucks for for a record. And I, I was sort of into Indian classical music, so I was you know mm -hmm. fishing around in that area. And I'm like, what's up with the, this film music? I started buying cassettes for ninety nine cents. And pretty soon, I guess it's just my analytical math brain, you know, I realized I could walk out of that store with 10, you know, a stack of 10 cassettes. And my chances of having an hour worth of great music were much better with 10 cassettes than buying one fucking CD of some lame avant-garde bullshit. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, it really right, just comes yeah. down to that. Yeah. And so I'd go through and I'd like, you know, make stars on, on all the best tunes and I'd make compilations for myself. I just started amassing this great collection. And then, then you'd find, you know, you'd find this one that you really loved on cassette. You'd find the, the record of it, you know, for a whole three dollars. Oh, so pretty soon it's like I'm, I've got all these really great vinyl records of Indian film music. That's how I discovered Artie Berman. And that Artie Berman oh. was was a, like the genius. Like he was the guy that I really loved from the from the from the Bollywood's kind of stuff. He also did Bengali films. So you could you know I started just really getting into him. And I pretty much started buying everything by him. And that's when I discovered at the bottom of a like a there was a bunch of spices stacked on a on records like bending <laughs> these records. Oh, and I found the the this golden. The, this gem called Shalimar and Secret Chiefs has covered three songs off of that record like in the in the 90s mostly oh yeah yeah the second second album. grand has two two songs from that record and Book M has one song from it it really had a huge that, that record had a huge that impact on me from? okay yeah so but that's uh, like none of that is like that's all still Western temperament. Artie Berman's mostly working in like you know uh, Western and Ananda Shankar too. I was listening to a lot of Ananda Shankar. Uh -huh. it's just rock. I mean, it's not right. It's not really with sitars and yeah. Yeah, so it's sort of easy to approach, and especially the production stuff. I mean, it, you know, the productions on those records are so vivid. Is that where you get your influence from? Mostly from the, the production aspect of things? Because I back really, then as a producer, like that's another thing that. I was going to ask you about. Like I would say back then, yeah. I mean, you can you can totally mm -hmm. hear it on the second grand, like the the, and and on book M, like a, mm -hmm. it's very Bollywood esque production. I learned a lot from. I mo actually mm -hmm. learned more from the Ananda Shankar records than, than from the R D Berman records. I think, just because the way the instruments come in and how overmixed certain parts are, and you know, it's really. Uh, Punching in on a floor tom track, you know, when you're punching a sitar in a floor tom track, you know, I, I was also limited to 16 tracks. So, oh, okay. So I, I you know, so this you is the economy of punching in all this stuff, and it's really inspiring, actually. It's a very poor man's, you know, studio thing that I was doing. Well, it, it, a lot of this seems to come back to uh, your music seems to come back to soundtracks. Yeah, for like, sure. Like you know, uh, there's obviously the influence from you know Morricone and and. 
you know, Italian horror stuff or, or John Carpenter. It's Obviously funny that people talk Halloween. about. I, I actually, I'm, I'm amazed like how often Morricone's name comes up because right. we've never done a Morricone tune. But everybody thinks, like, for example, the Exodus is a Morricone tune. Oh, really? Okay. I always hear that, and it's like, you know, oh, that Morricone spaghetti western tune that you do? Like, no, it's Ernest Gold, man. It's like, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's I'm not Hollywood, denying. But, of course I love, you know, Morricone, you know, yeah, of course. Morricone style, but. For sure, so, the Italians, I mean, you know, the, the, the Italian soundtrack stuff is just the greatest. Well, being that you're kind of a guitar-based band, and that, that you... What is the future of guitar music? Do you think? I mean, or guitar-centered kind of music? Man, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, because it, it seems like you guys kind of prove that guitar it can be the center piece of of music of a, a big I think, band ensemble. I think, it, yeah. Like if we if we expand our idea of what tonality is and stop being so locked into one tonal system, you know, thinking that we if we reshuffle the deck of twelve tones infinitely I mean you can do that but you can also do a lot of other things and that can help inspire you to reshuffle that deck in new ways you know like even when we're doing improvisational stuff now like even you know just this kind of clumsy garbage that I play on my own you know instrumental thing I'm, I'm noticing like you know I'm doing all this like stuff that does it in a western tonal sense which really just makes no sense at all but it, and it, but it only occurs to me because I've learned how to kind of sing in these other, uh, you know, sing really from the heart, you know, in these other uh, very, I guess in a way, simple diatonic, meaning, you know, just a seven note, two tetrachord scale. Uh, it helps. It actually helps with the 12 tone system. It helps with musicianship, I think, in some ways. Mm -hmm. So that's why I would say the future of guitar music sort of should be is to go outside of the, of the Western tonal system and kind of reinvigorate the Western music system. Well, I noticed like some of the members of, of uh, Dengue Fever were here, and I know you helped them out in the early days uh, with releasing the early Dengue Fever stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, the, kind first of the Cambodian rock stuff, and, and yeah, for sure, know, it seems to be that kind of thing is expanding a little more these days. So, yeah, I mean, I guess that record came out in like 2003 or something like that, mm -hmm. and. Uh, but it's also much simpler than that. Like I know Zach from the '80s. He was he went to Humboldt State University. Like that's how long I've known this that guy. Wow. <laughs> well, I guess they're shutting the lights on us, so I, we should probably wrap up. You yeah, get no respect. One quick you question. know, you get no respect. <laughs> you sell out the fucking place, and you know. It's just <laughs> so yeah, so when right. when when are you gonna score a film? That's my big question. I guess you know I would uh, I have no I'm nothing against it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Nobody's asked, you know. Like, really? I'm, I, well, one thing I'm you don't I'm, pursue it. Yeah, well, I'm not going to come and try to compete with all these guys who do all this MIDI shit, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. Like, yeah. if you want to do a record for cheap, those are the guys to hire. I mean, sure. that, that's they, they, well, and they're good at what they do. Well, they have their own orchestrator too, so they have just man. It's a, I have great respect for what they do. They're good at it. You know, they're good at what they do. If there was a director that like you know thought that what I did was special and could complement what they do, I'd be totally down. You know, if you want me to make a MIDI score for cheap and you know have it done tomorrow, I'm not the guy to call. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But it just seems like you have like a passion for film soundtrack music, and yeah, it would just be a natural thing. I, I would love to do it, you know, for sure. With the right situation, of course. You know, I'd, I'd dig way in deep to that. It'd be great. So hopefully, we'll hear that someday. Yeah. Well, it, it depends on. Uh, some modern day director deciding to do it. <laughs> but there are a few good directors out there. There are, I know, man. <laughs> Absolutely. No, there's good yeah. stuff going on. Actually, you know, I don't even know the guy's name, but you know the, the film The Machinist? Yeah, yeah, that was a great Man, film. that score, yeah. that score is fucking phenomenal. It's really, I, I really good. Did the score, we'll look that one up. Yeah, I mean, that was that, was that guy's first film, right? Yeah. I, mean, I don't know about the, the soundtrack, but it was, I heard it, I was like, Jesus. You know? No, there's good stuff going on for sure. I'm not knocking it. I just can't do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.